So I bought the Pine Phone Pro. I've had it for about a week and I've been daily using it for the past week and I was daily driving it for about three days as my exclusive cell phone. Um, I wanted to use this video just to share my thoughts on the Pine Phone, uh, do a bit of a review, but not like a super in-depth tech review. I'm not a mobile tech reviewer, so, uh, you know, it's a little outside of my wheelhouse, but I decided to uh, share my thoughts on it and kind of the bigger picture of what's going on with Android and what's going on with um, mobile Linux, because both of those are going to be uh, important in the next coming or in the next several years. So I'm on PinePhone's website here. I just want to go over a little bit of the specifications of the PinePhone just to familiarize ourselves with what it actually offers. So if you head over to pine64.org forward slash PinePhone Pro, you'll be greeted with this screen. Uh, and you can see the device specifications here. Uh, the Rockchip RK3399S, which is a bit of an upgrade over the previous PinePhone's um, SoC uh, GPU here. Uh, more than serviceable GPU, 4 gigabytes of LPDDR4 RAM, 128 gigabytes of flash storage, as well as an SD card reader. Um, what's really cool about the SD card reader is you can boot live operating systems from the SD card without having to flash them to your eMMC storage, which is really nice. Um, I wish more phones would offer this sort of thing, especially on the Android side of the world. Um, the LCD panel is pretty lackluster. Uh, it's a 720 panel, so, you know, it's not going to blow your mind. And if you're used to, you know, these super high pixel density, super high resolution panels with, you know, 120 hertz or 90 hertz refresh rates, uh, this is going to be like taking a step backwards in time to around like 2015. Uh, the camera is serviceable. I have no beef with the camera other than it doesn't work. <laughs> so we'll, we'll come back to that later. Uh, modem is fine. Wi-Fi is fine. The I.O. is great. Uh, sensors is everything you would um, come to expect from a mobile phone. Uh, what's really nice are these privacy hardware switches. Uh, these are physical kill switches on the back of the phone underneath the, um, the back case uh, where you can actually physically disconnect the cameras, microphones, your modems, your Wi-Fi, and your headphones. So, you know, if you don't want to be tracked, number one, you're on a Linux phone, you're, you're not being tracked. But if you needed that extra step toward privacy just to be sure, you can always physically kill the things that you're worried about. Um, the external buttons, yep, an on-off and a, a volume rocker. Has a headphone jack, which is nice. Uh, it comes with a flash torch, which is really just like the bright LED on the back of the phone that you can use to use as a flashlight. Uh, this Samsung J7 battery, which is a pretty common battery, uh, available on Amazon or on PinePhone for around 10 bucks, or Pine64 rather. Uh, but it's only 3,000 milliamps, which is a pretty undersized battery, and we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, and then the rest is, you know, you can look at your leisure here. So PinePhone, or Pine64 is pretty transparent about who the phone is for and about who the phone isn't for. And you can see that here. Um, they, they really warn against coming into this hardware with exceedingly high expectations. Most of the operating systems being developed for the Pine phone are still very much in their beta. And it's not a polished user experience yet. And so they're, they're very transparent about that. If you're expecting to get something on par or something in parity with Android or iOS from the PinePhone Pro, you're going to be disappointed. So they warn against that here. And so buyer beware. You know, if you buy this expecting a daily driver out of the box, buyer be warned. It's not going to do that. Um, but who it is for are people like you and me, or, you know, people like me at least, who are Linux enthusiasts, who are getting a little bit fed up with Android and iOS and are looking for a true free and open source software alternative to um, the current mobile paradigm. And so it's when I bought the phone, I really bought it to throw support toward mobile Linux financially and just to have kind of something to play around with and see how it develops. Uh, so that's the phone. I, I will say from the hardware specifications, the hardware is fine. 
You know, if you bought a phone with this hardware and ran Android, it wouldn't be the most polished and it wouldn't be the most like inspiring user experience, but you would use it. It would be a fine phone to use. And it's about on par with like a mid range or entry level Android phone. Um, so the hardware, which is what Pine64 is in charge of, is, is completely serv- serviceable. It's great. Where the Pine phone, from my perspective, starts to fall apart is on the software side of things. So as I said a moment ago, um, the software for Pine, Pine phone Pro is still very much in the beta. It ships... Sorry, I got some construction going on if you can hear that. It ships out of the box with Manjaro uh, KDE, which I found completely unusable. It's very slow, very stuttery. Um, it doesn't receive MMS out of the box. Uh, the phone calls are are very, I don't know, distorted on on both the microphone end and on the speaker end. It kind of feels like you're talking in a tunnel. I don't know if that's a hardware issue or a software issue. The App Store isn't populated or well supported. The couple apps I did try to install from the App Store didn't install correctly. And I've read reports online that system updates have soft bricked a lot of people's phones. So, you know, going into the terminal on the phone and and doing sudo pacman syyu to update your system actually broke a lot of dependencies on the phone and soft bricked people's phones. And they were forced to reset the phone or um, install a new operating system. So KDE... Um, the, the team behind the KDE plasma desktop environment or whoever's maintaining these forks, uh, I'm sure they'll be coming out with a couple updates in the near future to address some of these problems. But again, I found KDE plasma or KDE mobile, whatever it's called, uh, borderline unusable on the phone, which is why I switched over to, it's called Fosh, Manjaro Fosh. And I actually flashed that onto my EMMC, even though they warn against flashing to your your actual storage and they just recommend booting from the SD card. Uh, So that being said, what we're going to look at today uh, on the hardware side of things is actually Manjaro Fosh, which doesn't ship out of the box, but I found wholly more usable than the Manjaro KDE um, operating system. So I've got my phone here. You guys can see it. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and boot it and kind of take you through the ins and outs of my experience with this phone. And then I'll provide some thoughts at the end. So let's go ahead and boot this. So we have our loading screen here. And it boots relatively fast. Um, Faster than a lot of Android phones that I've worked with. So here we are, we're booted. Let me see if I can get that glare out of the way a little bit. Okay, Uh, we're gonna go ahead and unlock the phone. And you guys can see my password. Cool. All right, so this is Manjaro Fosh. Um, It's a little bit different than how Android's laid out. You are just constantly on this um, like app drawer, what we would consider an app drawer from the iOS side of, or from the Android side of things. And there's no way to get rid of that. That's just how the operating system is laid out. This might change as Fosh enters, hopefully, a post-beta stage pretty soon. Um, but you can see everything here connected to the Wi-Fi. I don't have my SIM card in right now. Uh, you have this like top panel over here that drops down. Uh, you know, similar to Android. See your battery, see your flashlight, notifications, Bluetooth setting, your volume, and your dimmer. And we can get out of that. Uh, the phone is very responsive. Again, this is much more usable than um, the KDE was. There's not a lot of lag or stuttering as I scroll, which is nice. I know that was a problem on the original Pine phone, but you know the the processor is more than capable of handling this sort of operating system. Um, nothing to write home about here. Uh, where we start to get into trouble, however, is like for simple tasks that you would like to use on your phone. Like say I go into my camera. And we'll try to boot my camera. And then we're just kind of hanging on this screen. And I've let this run indefinitely. I've let this run for like 10 minutes trying to boot the camera. And so far I haven't been able to boot the camera. And I'm pretty sure I read somewhere that the camera hardware isn't supported by the software yet. So hopefully that gets addressed soon. So I'm going to click this little bottom arrow here. And it's going to kill the operation. And that's it. 
Um, coming over here to messages. Uh, I don't know if I have messages on here. Yeah, I do. So you're going to see some of my contacts. I'll blur that out. Messages are fine. It sends and receives SMS perfectly. I haven't had an issue receiving um, or sending just standard text messages, but I haven't been able to send or receive a MMS yet. So like pictures or GIFs or anything like that. Um, that's just all been non, <laughs> hasn't been working um, since the time I've been using the phone, which is, you know, a bit of a problem uh, for a lot of people who are expecting to use this as a, a phone replacement. One other glaring issue with messages is I haven't been able to get um, group texts working. And, you know, a lot of people rely on group text now. Um, I know I do. It, it becomes like a surrogate social media in a way with just the people you care about. So having that feature missing is is disappointing, but understandable, especially as most of the software is still in a beta stage. Um, we have a music player, Lollipop. This is actually what I use on my computer as well. Lollipop is a serviceable media player. I've got no issues with it. You have artists, albums, that sort of thing. It all plays fine. There's nothing to write home about. Um, haven't had an issue with it. Very run-of-the-mill standard media player. Go ahead and kill that. Uh, all the other included apps are what you would expect. Um, what's really nice is you have your terminal, which is a full-fledged, full-fat terminal you can use to get under the hood of your phone. Great stuff. And over here we have an app store. Now the app store is absolutely awful. The App Store, it's just nothing is supported really. Like you have some of these here populated on the front screen, but like it, it's all just from their mo mobile repositories. And so there's not a lot of support yet for any sort of apps. And especially if you plan on um, daily driving this and expecting some sort of support from uh, like Android style apps, like a banking app or like Signal Messenger, a lot of people use you're not going to be able to get it through the app store. Um, you're probably not even going to be able to get it at this point through the terminal or through adding different repositories. But, you know, I haven't had the need to really come into the app store yet because the apps they provide are serviceable. Firefox works, the phone works, the uh, text messenger works, maps works, all of this stuff works. I've got no complaint with the phone. This is exactly what I was expecting when I bought it. Um, and for the most part, it's a completely serviceable daily driver. If you live a pretty austere digital life and you don't need to use your phone for a lot of, you know, hyper-specialized proprietary things, you're going to be great here. If, if what you're looking for is a non-Google, non-Android phone, PinePhone Pro will work. The caveat, and this is the big one, out of the box, power management is broken. When I close the screen... It actually doesn't, from what I understand, it actually doesn't kill the processes happening in the background. The phone is still running at full capacity. It's just the screen is off, which is obviously a big issue for battery life because you just have your phone running full tilt straight, you know, even with the screen off. And so if I come over here and unlock my phone again, come over here to battery life, You've already seen it tick down just in the couple minutes I've been using it to show you guys. Several percent. I think I started around, what, 82 or 83 percent. It's already at 78. And that's what I've noticed from using the phone is usage. It ticks down a percent, maybe a percent and a half, about every minute. On idle, it ticks down a percent about every 90 seconds to two minutes. So on idle, I've really only been able to get maybe two hours out of the phone before it needs to be charged. Uh, on usage, I usually get maybe an hour to 75 minutes, depending on what I'm doing. Video playback, you're going to be done in probably like 45 minutes. Uh, and that kind of makes the phone unusable as a phone. You know, if you, if you constantly need to be tethered to a wall or to a, you know, a power brick, and uh, constantly charging your phone, it kind of defeats the purpose of having a mobile phone. Um, and so I've been sleuthing around online. I've I've kind of got the sense that this was a problem on the original Pine phone as well, and that the software side of things eventually uh, solved the issue, and now people are getting upwards of like two or three days on idle, which is more than enough. That That's probably in practical usage about a full day. You can go to work, come home, use it at night and then plug it in and still have some juice left over. 
So that's really the biggest hang up right now for me that prevents me from using this as a daily driver is just the battery life is god awful. Um, but hopefully that will be addressed. Now, some warnings um, about the Pine phone here. A lot of people online have been complaining that they've soft bricked their phone, which is another power management issue. What's really going on is you can't charge the phone without the phone booting currently. When you plug in your phone, even when it's off to charge it, it will boot and start running again, which obviously slows, slows down the charging process. But the bigger problem is when the battery is fully dead and you go to plug it in to charge the battery, the phone has a hard time drawing enough current to get into the boot run. And so you need to boot the phone to charge it, but you can't boot the phone because it's not charged. And a lot of people have gotten online and, and complained that they've uh, bricked their phone, but I, I think it's mostly just the battery died and they're unable to charge it. I haven't had an issue with this with a high wattage charger. Um, my phone has died and I was able to charge it uh, with the battery on the Pine phone or with the battery in the Pine phone just by hooking it up to a high wattage charger. You can always take the uh, battery out and if you have an external charging station, I know they sell some on Pine 64, you can charge it there and it should run again. Or if you have an older Pine phone, um, you'll be able to uh, just take the battery out of this one, put it in that Pine phone and charge it just fine. So final thoughts with the phone. Um, it's not ready yet. It's not ready to daily drive yet. Has nothing to do with the hardware side of things. This is all completely software uh, issues from my perspective. It's close. I think probably within the next three to four weeks, these power management issues will be fixed, which will you know add, add a lot of longevity to how you use the phone. It'll make it daily drivable. And I think probably within this calendar year, we should see some of these operating systems leave the beta stage and make it into like a initial release. And I think once that happens, um, the Pine phone is really gonna mature and the Linux mobile operating system is gonna come into its own. Uh, so if you're on the fence about buying it, uh, if you've been looking at reviews like this one, or if you've been on their website and kind of pining over it, no pun intended, um, I, I would hold off. If you're on the fence, I would hold off. If you're a tech enthusiast, uh, if you're already really familiar with running Linux on your computer and you're familiar with troubleshooting issues behind the terminal and you're willing to kind of roll up your sleeves and get under the hood and have something that you need to maintain and work on in order for it to be workable, if you like that sort of thing, yeah, $400 if you've got the cash, it's not going to break the bank. Um, and it's it's a good phone. It's fun to play with. Or the other, you know, user who might want to consider it is people seeking to get out of Android, to get out of iOS uh, without having to buy, say, a Pixel and install Graphene OS or uh, Calyx OS, right? So if you're really just kind of trying to support the mobile Linux world financially, buying the phone is a great first step. Um, if you're looking for a daily driver, I would say wait a couple months, see if these power uh, management issues get solved. Otherwise, it's a it's a great phone. I'm having a blast with it. I think um, in a couple of months, it's going to be more than serviceable. So I think uh, for the time being, I'm going to call this video. Uh, and I'm, I think I'll do like maybe a weekly or a monthly update to what's going on with the phone. Probably monthly. Do a monthly update, see what's going on with the phone, see what updates have come out, see how it's working, and uh, see if we can get it to a daily drivable state. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.